What's up, Lions? For as little as $5 a month, you can help this show to grow while also getting access to our exclusive Pride content, which includes shows like Conspiracy Corner, Degenerate Gamblers, Special Interviews, Lions of Liberty Roundtables, and much, much more. So check that out. Help us grow at lionsofliberty.com forward slash support. The idea that has to get into people's head is there's a very, very, very good, powerful way to create peace and harmony. And that's just something very basic. You leave me alone on my property, I'll leave you alone on your property. Welcome to the Lions of Liberty podcast. Here's your host, your guide, your shining beacon of liberty, Mark Clare. Yo, what up, doggies, and welcome back to the best libertarian podcast that you are going to listen to in the next uh, 45 minutes. How about that? Uh, This is Lions of Liberty. This is your home for great conversations about the ideas of liberty, and this is the only libertarian variety show out there because it's not just me here every Monday bringing you interesting interviews like the one you're going to hear today as well as fun round tables in the form of libertarians in living rooms drinking liquor every once in a while. We also have several other shows on this podcast feed. Every Wednesday, Brian McWilliams brings you your weekly shot of comedy, culture, and liberty with Electric Liberty Land. And my man, John Odie Odermatt, wraps things up every Friday with his hard-hitting look at the broken criminal justice system on Felony Friday. So be sure to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss a darn thing. I'm very happy to report that our podcast feed is fully functional now, and we have taken some steps to make sure that uh, the little malfunction that we had a week or so ago does not occur again. Uh, if those of you miss John Odermatt's interview with Adam Kokesh or my interview with Anthony Samaroff, go tick back in your podcast feed. Those episodes are both functioning. You can listen to them. They're both excellent, excellent conversations, if I do say so myself. And speaking of excellent conversations, there's another one coming for you today in this, the 346th episode of the Lions of Liberty podcast. And that means you can find today's show notes featuring links to all sorts of things that get mentioned over at lionsofliberty.com slash 346. Let's get to it, shall we? Today's guest is making his third appearance on this program. He was most recently on the show back in January, where he debated Walter Block on the subject of Donald Trump. That was an exciting one. He is the editor and publisher over at EconomicPolicyJournal.com, as well as TargetLiberty.com. And he's here today to discuss his book, Foundations of a Private Property Society, Anarchism for the Civilized Person. I'm very pleased to welcome the uh, always civilized Mr. Robert Wenzel. Robert, are you ready to roar? You know, I, I don't roar a lot, but I'll tell you what I do is prowl. So I'm I'm out here prowling ready for <laughs> anything you're going to throw at me. Well, before the roar comes the prowl anyway. So, you know, you got to have one before the other. Right, right. I think. I don't know. That might be that might be a weird analogy, but I think we all get the point that you're out there uh, on the hunt for new ideas. Uh, you're always on the hunt for the conversation about the ideas of liberty, and, that, and that's exactly what we do here. Now, uh, you first appeared on this program actually way back uh, early on in the run, uh, actually episode 22. I looked that up earlier, and a lot more people are listening to the show today than they were almost five years ago. So maybe you can just start off by quickly recapping how you first became interested in libertarian ideas. Okay, well, I I first became interested in libertarian ideas a very, very long time ago when a book came out in probably 1969 by Harry Brown called How You Can Profit from the Coming Devaluation. And uh, I was was probably in seventh or eighth grade or something like that at the time. And I I read the book and he he approached uh, his theory with regard to what was going to happen to the economy. He was very bullish on Gold and silver and gold was, I believe, at $35 an ounce at that time. It had not been uh, been freed up for Americans to own. And um, he approached it, uh, Harry Brown approached it from an Austrian school perspective. And he had a bibliography in there. And back in those days, there was no, no internet, no Amazon. And there were very, very few books published on uh, Austrian school economics. So I, I, I hardlined on the... Uh, on the books that uh, Brown had in his bibliography, which included the theory of money and credit, uh, Murray Rothbard's What Has Government Done to Our Money? And then uh, then it was off to the races from there and not very difficult to become a libertarian once you absorb that at a very early age. 
Yeah, I can't imagine that many of your classmates in in seventh or eighth grade were were reading about economic collapse. How did you? How do you think you ended up being the kind of person that would find themselves with that book in their hands at that young an age? Well, you know, I, at at that age, I was uh, interested already interested in investments in money. So that was probably about the third or fourth book that I read on uh, on in investments. The other box books were. Uh, Stock market books. As a matter of fact, I can still remember the names of those books. There was one by uh, Morton Shulman. There was a book by uh, Richard Ney called The Wall Street Jungle. And uh, then then Harry Brown's uh, soon followed after that. After that. So always interested in money and curious about money. All right, now, Robert, uh, you know, over the years, there have been many, many works written uh, attempting to lay out the case for a libertarian society or a private property society, if you will. Uh, so why did you decide to write your own little treatise here? What, what did you feel was missing from the dialogue uh, that inspired you to get your own ideas out there? Okay, uh, wh- what I'm doing is I'm taking it from a, a little bit of a different approach than uh, uh, two of my heroes, Murray Rothbard and Ludwig von Mises. Ludwig von Mises used a uh, utilitarianism argument for uh, justifying free markets and in uh, a free society. And a utilitarianism is, is basically saying, you know, this looks like it will be key. He took a broad range utilitarian perspective and he said, you know, this looks like it will be best for, mo- for most people. And he's, he's probably true in, in, in that sense, but it's sort of uh, – uh, it, it comes out to sort of being a, a tyranny of the majority. If you're sort of going to look and vote and determine, you know, what's best for people, there's a lot of people that would be in the minority and, and you know, could, could get hurt by that kind of perspective, um, which is a perspective that Murray Rothbard, I think, correctly uh, criticized when, when he talked about a libertarian theory, but then he took a natural rights theory perspective. And I, that, that, Theory just does not follow as far as I'm concerned. There, there's there's basics there that go back to John Locke and John Locke t- talking about we own ourselves and therefore we have these rights. But I see that and, that, and what's, what's really interesting is I uh, recognize and appreciate Murray Rothbard's criticism of Ludwig von Mises' utilitarian perspective. But on the other hand, I recognize and appreciate Ludwig von Mises' perspective and criticism of natural rights, because if you don't really have this, it's not sort of the logical thing of two plus two equals four. It's more like, okay, Locke says we own ourselves, therefore there are rights. And it doesn't flow. And Henry Hazlitt wrote a book called The uh, Foundations of Morality, which was, uh, uh, he was he was very much in contact with Mises at the time. And there's, there's a lot of thinkers, including Richard Ebling, who has studied Mises very well, who thinks that uh, Hazlitt basically wrote that book a- as an attempt to get out Mises' perspective on morality. And uh, in, in that book, uh, Hazlitt calls natural rights uh, sort of a mystical view. And I, I, I kind of understand where he's getting that perspective from, because it's, the, again, there's, there's not this logical flow. And then what happens is once you say, well, people have a right to, to freedom then, then you've got people claiming there's rights to health care and this, and this and that and the other thing, education, uh, uh, um, a basic income, and, and, and it doesn't stop. And because there's no logical argument for the first idea with regard to natural rights, it, you know, people can just throw things out. So, so I, don't, I don't think that works. So I've always been um, concerned that there really hasn't been the proper foundation for uh, advancing liberty. And uh, so, so I've thought a lot about it. And uh, uh, the Nobel Prize winning economist Friedrich Hayek talked about in economics that most of the advances were uh, more application of subjectivist perspective in theory. And that's how economics has developed. And it's not a, a, a complete move, uh, exact replica in, in, with regard to social theory, but I take a subjectivist perspective to justifying uh, a libertarian approach, a private property approach. And what I might, what I mean by that is, instead of saying, "Well, utilitarianism justifies liberty because it's going to help most people," well, Rothbard sort of wipes that out. And Rothbard takes the natural rights perspective, and Mises, I think, correctly wipes that out. 
So it's like, how do we get to this idea that liberty is good? Because I think liberty is good. So I take it to a subjectivist perspective. And I don't look at the, the rest of the world out there as, as the first step. I look to myself and I say, well, for me, as an individual on this planet, what would be the best way for society to exist? And my answer is, hey, if, if, if we allow liberty, if we allow exchange, it's going to be best because there's going to be all kinds of people out there exchanging things and inc- increasing the standard of living, and uh, there'll, there'll be general peace and harmony. So I say to myself, I would like that. And then I argue that, you know, I think a lot of other people would like that also. So it's not utilitarian in in the sense of arguing, yes, all kinds of people are going to like it. It's more like, you know, there probably are going to be other people that will like it. And if I control a piece of land, I can basically do two things with it. And that's either make deals with other people who have property. So we're both left alone or sort of battle people and and, and fight over properties. But if, if we're battling all the time, it's not going to create a very high standard of living. So my argument is that on a very fundamental level, people uh, appreciate the necessity of, for, for property. I, you know, I, I walk the streets at very odd hours of the night, whether I'm, I'm in San Francisco or traveling in New York, or wherever it is. And what you see is even the homeless sort of find their own spots and go to the same spots every night. And I think that's a lot, a lot about it, it's it's sort of explained by uh, by economics in the sense that you don't want to raise your cost. If you find a place where, where you're comfortable and you feel safe, you know, why have to go through that every night? So even for a homeless person, it's important to sort of have his own own little spot of land where, where he can sleep. And for for the rest of us, where we have uh, lots of goods and properties and uh, goods and and, uh, and families and uh businesses. We, we want something where we can sort of st- store this stuff and, and keep it in the same place on, on a regular basis. I mean, people may travel, they may go to hotels and things like that. But for the most part, if you've got a situation where people, it's very important to have property where you can feel safe, store things, operate, raise a family, whatever it might be. So my argument is, okay, so how do we get from liberty when we recognize that people want property where they can feel safe and go to the same place every night and store things. And my argument is the way we can do this is by going to the other person who has a property and saying, hey, look, leave me alone on my property and I'll leave you alone on your property. And for, for most people, it would make sense because then you, you don't, you're not battling each other. You're not wasting time. You're, you, you can spend that time doing creative things versus worrying about the person next to you. Now, admittedly, there, there could be people that cheat and lie and, and do all that kind of stuff. So in, in my book, uh, I talk, uh, I, I devote a chapter to how security would develop, how uh, uh, courts would develop and, and all that. But the essential foundation is, you know, there, there's not some kind of overarching rule, a utilitarian rule or a natural rights rule that applies overall that we have to recognize because there is it. There is no, you know, we can argue all day long that people have a right to uh, uh, this or that, but may, many people may not have it. So I look at it from an individual perspective, from a methodological individualist perspective. And Hayek, uh, D- uh, David Gordon, a, a, a current philosopher who studied under uh, Hayek, talked about H- Hayek uh, seeing methodological individualism and subjectivism is very, very close. So, so again, it's not a perfect move from the economic analysis, the way subjectivism, methodolo- methodological individualism is, is used, but it's very, very close. And so the way I look at it is, okay, from the way we can get to liberty with, without dealing with the problems that the utilitarianism and the natural rights uh, people have, have is to just say, look, from, from your own perspective, it makes sense to cut a deal with people around you so you're not battling each other. And then from there, I just sort of developed the whole idea of how, uh, how society would develop and uh, why the standard of living would be uh, – very high in, in, in that kind of society. And now, Robert, when you uh, sort of talk about you know um, how property owners in, you know naturally want to sort of cut a deal with their neighbors in a sense of you know just 
the idea of respecting each other's property and that sort of thing, I think a lot of people, especially people that aren't libertarians, might just say, well, that's what government is. It's where we cut this deal with the people in our city, in our state, in our nation to uh, have a certain set of rules. And then uh, we have a nice little system where we all vote on representation and then we all come up with these rules and we all sort of agree to abide by them. Now, I know most libertarians are going to kind of laugh at that idea, but the everyday man out there on the street, I talk to them all the time. And this is generally their conception of what government currently is even. So how would you talk to sort of a non-libertarian about this idea who might sort of think in their minds, well, that's already what we have. That is that is the current represent go- representative government as we see it today. How can you sort of show them that what your view vision is, is, is vastly different from that? Sure. Uh, uh, basically, uh, this, this is a good question because when you've got government, what they're doing is they're, they're making rules for everyone on everyone's property, whether you may agree with them or not. What I'm saying is, look, let's cut deals with people on their properties and we leave them alone. They can do anything they want. They can run around naked if they want. They can uh, take LSD if they want, as long as they leave us alone on our property. If we 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 want to uh, make some kind of rule that everybody walks around in a suit, well, you know, so, so be it. So there's no general rules. Whereas what happens when you get a government, the government is making rules for your property, even though you may disagree with those rules. And then what happens is the government becomes a power center and people strive to gain control of that power center because you can make a lot of money by it. You can uh, uh, get your jollies off if if you're a a sadistic kind of person and like to control things. And uh, Hayek in his book, The Road to Serfdom, talked about how the worst get on top in, in political systems and especially when it's, when it's really on the road to uh, totalitarianism. And the, the reason is the, the, uh, the people who really want power will do whatever it takes to gain that power. And they will be as vicious as they have to be. They will lie as much as they have to be. They will create situations where uh, – it will appear one thing is occurring and another is occurring, so so they gain power. And th- then they rule over all of us. And we, we've seen this has been a, a terrible thing throughout the history of man. Uh, uh, Hitler in Germany, Stalin in the Soviet Union, Mao in uh, China, to just name three obvious uh, uh, rulers of, of power centers who killed literally hundreds of millions of people. So my argument is, Do you just want a situation where you just leave everybody alone on their own property and they leave you alone on your property? Or do you want to create a structure which creates a a power point, center center point, where there's a ruler that will make rules over your property, whether you like it or not, and you're going to get bad guys that eventually get to the top because they're the ones that will do what it takes to get there. Obviously, your book is titled The Foundations of a Private Property Society. And if you're going to have a society based on private property – and uh, foundationally speaking, we need to sort of have some kind of agreement or, or consensus of some sort about how property rights are determined. So do, do you have a concept in mind of how within this sort of subjective economic theory uh, that, that ties it back into your private property society, how are, are those property rights determined? And I mean, because subjectively speaking, you could say, I, I might just walk down the street and point at my neighborhood and say, well, subjectively, I feel this whole area is my property, so so it should be mine. I mean, how, how do you think people that take this approach could actually sort the the fundamental idea of what is property in the first place out because you know before they actually move on to making deals to protect their property and agreements with their neighbors and that sort of thing i really reject that idea of rights so i don't even think there are property rights i i think we just live in a world where situations exist and there's there's just no overarching rights not not even property rights the way i look at it is uh, property could be split up all kinds of ways. I mean, there, there's in virgin land, there's a lot of people that uh, argue, again, from a Lockean perspective that it's land and labor mix. But I argue, you know, that, that that's sort of a makeshift idea that that sort of works. And I don't have 100 percent objection to to the way uh, property is gained that way in, in virgin land. But I do point out it's not necessarily some kind of fair and just natural rights perspective because you you know it's it's hurting all kinds of pre- people uh, a blind person is not, not in no way going to be able to uh, 
uh, operate a, a, on a land and, and mix it with his labor to the degree that a person can see. Same thing with a person in a wheelchair. Same thing with a person um, who uh, who is elderly. You know, you, you're you're really creating a a, a a land ownership that is for the uh, the strong. So so again, I, again, I, I don't completely object to that. But I'm just pointing out it's it's not really some kind of magical justice going on there. Well, how, how would that be different in your view then in in the private property society? Because aren't you know how else are people going to acquire property in that in that case to to the point that we now can discuss how we interact with each other? Then you know, if you putting aside the idea of rights, how do you just see people acquiring property in the first place? I mean, don't do you think the strong would also acquire property just you know naturally even in you know the view you're taking? Well, as a matter of fact, I, I have a post up now at uh, Target Liberty where I say, you know, we would not we haven't occupied the moon and maybe we really should all get together. I mean, this is this is a big maybe to get the whole population of the Earth together. But let's divide up the moon right now. There is uh, roughly sev- seven billion. Maybe it's closer to seven and a half billion people now. And uh, the mass, the mass surface mass of the moon is uh, 14.6 million square miles, which works out to 55,756 square feet. So why can't we all agree to just split it up? And, you know, we really don't know what land may be more valuable than others. So let's just distribute this one little parcel to, to everybody on Earth and they can either save them. Save the pieces, the plots, sell them, ignore them, whatever they want with it. That's the way that virgin land can be uh, divided up. And in, 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 a, in a way, I mean, again, I, I'm, I'm not a big fan of talking about fairness because I, I, don't, I don't think there's, there's, there's always uh, – the, the world is very, very complex. So there's always going to be ways that emerge that uh, do not cause fairness, whatever, whatever it is. I should say the universe if we're talking about the, the moon. But, um, you know, why, why can't you split up land that way? Why can't you even even if there's desert land, why can't you split it up that way? Just give a little bit to bit to everybody. And um, I'm, I'm debating this with the uh, the uh, economist, libertarian philosopher Walter Block right now. And one, one argument he has is, well, these are going to be small parcels of land. So what can anybody do with them? It's a, it's a it's a terrible idea. And, and my point is, well, not really, because if the if the land is only worth, say, a penny, then you could get some kind of developer just the way that it happens now, buy up a bunch of them and 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 build it into uh, a, a a plot that becomes something that can be developed. And so um, uh, we, we were he he also brought up the idea of of splitting up the ocean, and he argued that it was uh, a terrible idea to split up the ocean that way. But then I asked him if uh, if he prefers the, the ocean to be commons land, where we have all kinds of destruction of fish in the land and plastic being dumped and all that kind of stuff. And he agreed with me that, you know, private property, even if it is these small divisions, is a better situation than uh, than having the commons mess we have now. And uh, you, you really have to understand that even if it's small parcels of land, virgin land or virgin ocean or whatever, they, they would move around if if uh, if they're not worth a lot developers would come in and just just accumulate them to the degree that it would be uh significant to develop them in in the way uh that uh, the economy would call for at a certain time how do you see that working sort of i guess in our present day you know where we where we already have a society where a lot of people have property some people like the homeless you mentioned might have less than others but people sort of see whatever they have as their own property um and how how do you see that this sort of relating to um i, I guess over time, ideally, in your in your view, you would want societies to sort of slowly morph into seeing things the way you do, or else why would you be talking about it uh, in this sort of subjective economic way uh, that leads them to believe in? I, I want to not use the word rights because I know you oppose that, but but um, just in in the concept, I guess, of private property. So how do you how do you see yourself being able to to take people like I mean, for example, you live in San Francisco, where obviously most people there clearly don't share your view on things. So how do you expect to go about arguing for and convincing your fellow man? of the need for this private property-based society. Yeah, well, it, it's the, the first thing uh, you know I want to address is, is, is given the, the current society where there is a lot of private property ownership. And, and I argue in the book that, hey, the only way we're going to get to a private property society is if we just sort of 
agree that the people that currently own properties, they should keep their properties and, and start from, from that perspective. Because if, if you're going to start from a situation where you're going to start taking property away from people, everybody and, and do something with it, you, you're, you're not going to know. There's going to be an awful lot of people, powerful people who have property who, who are not going to agree to that kind of uh, society. So I, again, I, 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 I don't really see it important as to how things initially develop. I'm, I'm very, very, or, or, or how, as far as property boundaries, because I, I, I th this is going a little bit off, but I, I'm a subscriber to uh, Professor Israel Kirzner, who I think should win a Nobel Prize, and his work in entrepreneurship. And he points out that entrepreneurship is, is about vision and seeing opportunity, even if you don't have a lot of capital or property. And, and just by that vision and knowing where to get capital or where to get property for for a project that, that you can um, uh, make make entrepreneurial profit. So so I don't see the current uh, division of property as a barrier for uh, for 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 people who are are creative. And so my my argument is, hey, let's just leave the property the way it is. I, I don't have a problem with that. And it would be nearly impossible to try and promote a private property society. Uh, we, we're going to take it away from from people, and I don't see why you should take it away. I mean, it's 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 just leave it the way it is. Now, now as far as promoting a private property society, I see that as an extremely difficult, long term process. I I do not expect to see it in my lifetime. I I promote this largely because I like the intellectual battle. I, I like to present new ideas. I like to throw them up against the utilitarians and the uh, natural rights people and the socialists and all that. I like the battle, and uh, it would it would re for for private so property society to take hold. Um, uh, again, I, I go to Hayek who talked about secondhand dealers and ideas as being very very important in getting uh, ideas across to society generally. And so the way I, I see a private property society that could develop is at some point. A lot of secondhand dealers and ideas. These are these are people who uh, the masses sort of respect, and and the the secondhand dealers are able to influence the masses and get them to think in a certain way. But when and how secondhand dealers would actually sort of grab and start promoting a private property society, I, I have no idea. It's possible. It could it could never happen. But I, I like promoting the idea, and you don't really know how ideas flow and who catches on to something and, and where where it would uh, uh, develop a, a stronger following. What about when it comes to, I guess, uh, disputes about property and, and the concepts of crime and criminal justice? You sort of mentioned that a little bit at the top, and you do go into it a bit more in your book. But how would uh, how do you see things playing out where your private property society would address, let's say, disputes about property, you know, disputes over property or or simply something as simple as, as theft of property? How would that be resolved um, as you see it between these agreements between neighbors? OK, so so what I see is that each individual person or property owner or even even someone who doesn't have property could hire some kind of private security firm and the way I like it I mean you know I, I like to think at sort of basic level so it's easy to understand how how it works so say I'm in in some some small area and I've, I've got a piece of land but I'm afraid that you know the the caveman next door might you know try and steal the the, the fruit I collected or or the deer I shot or something like that. So I may want protection. So what I'm going to look for is the biggest, strongest guy in the area. And uh, uh, to liken that to, to, to modern day, you know, we, we see these cell phone advertisements where the cell phone shows where it has coverage all over an area. So when you get a private property sec security firm that, that really has uh, strength and power and ability. And if you travel or you go on vacations, you know, they, they guarantee that they, they would be able to protect you there either because they have uh, their own security people in those areas or they um, they have an agreement with security people in those areas. So I, I sort of picture a map and say, you know, this is us. This is our security. We'll deal with whatever's going on here and there. But my neighbor's going to want a security firm also. And he could he could use the same security firm I have. So if, if we're both signing up to the same security firm, the security firm is going to say, hey, look, you know, we're representing other people and these are our rules. 
Uh, you can't steal anything from anybody's property. And if somebody charges you with this, we're going to take you to our security court where we have the wisest and best judges and, and you have to agree to, uh, to abide by, by the ruling and, and we're going to enforce that. Or they may say, look, we'll, we'll represent you here against any other security firm anywhere else. But if, if they're a, um, a, a, a big security firm that we have an agreement with, where we, we both agree that we take everything to a, uh, a, a given neutral arbiter or a given neutral court system, a given neutral judge, you have to abide by that because we're, we're not going to go around, you know, we're here to make money, not to go around shooting people up all over the place. So it's, it's, it, there's a subtle thing going on here. If you want to be a complete loner and you're not messing with anybody else, you can sort of have your own little private property. And you don't have to have any security if, if you if you don't think um, you want it and it's not necessary that no one's going to bother you where you are. However, for everybody else, they're going to want one of these big security firms that has relationships with all the other security firms so things get resolved. So they're going to look for um, private property firms, uh, security firms that uh, are, are known for being straight shooters. That, that are known for handling things, uh, protecting property, and not creating distortions or anything like that. Now, now we have you know, crooked judges, we have crooked courts, we have laws on, on all kinds of things that you, you may say, say you're a marijuana smoker. You may want to smoke marijuana, so you would never hire a, a security firm that is going to throw you in jail for that. You're going to hire one that's, that's, that is very strong in protecting um, you so that you you, you can smoke uh, marijuana. So you, you you would get these um, uh, situations where these these large security firms would develop, which would basically give people freedom because that's the only way they're going to att attract a lot of people. If they start making a bunch of rules that you know people think are oppressive, they're going to they're going to avoid those uh, security firms. And because the security firm is their actual client or they're actually being paid by these customers as opposed to government where you don't really have a choice about you know the monopoly uh, that we certainly have uh, at least in our modern form of government uh, th for that reason they won't be violating again I don't want to say the rights but what, we, what a lot of the people see as rights anyway uh, smoking marijuana or do, doing basically whatever they want on their own property as long as they're not hurting others right see see what you've got with government is you've got a central government that is making decisions for all properties everywhere. And if you defy those laws, whatever they are, their, their government monopoly police will, will arrest you and throw you in jail. You have no choice, nothing. Whereas in my private property society, you're going to want a big law uh, security firm so that it can protect you against all kinds of uh, uh, threats. But at the same time, that large security firm because it doesn't have a monopoly on you, you can go to a, another large one. They're going to try and, and offer a situation where there's, there's very, very little as far as uh, rules and regulations that they, they enforce that um, basically just, just allow freedom. Because pe people uh, under, under freedom can, can do what they want on their property. So that, that's the kind of thing that would develop. My name is Dale Kearns, and I'm running for United States Senate in Pennsylvania as a libertarian. I'm a concerned citizen who has had enough. I work as a project manager for an electrical contractor in southeastern Pennsylvania. There I manage large commercial and industrial projects. I'm a husband and a father of two energetic little girls. I'm running to advocate for a society where my girls have more liberty, not less. Will you support our campaign? Unlike my competitors, I'm not a career politician. I don't have millionaire and billionaire donors. I'm running for Senate in Pennsylvania because I want to take the message to Washington that we want government out of our lives. Will you let me be your voice? Let me be the voice that says we will not walk quietly down the road to serfdom. The voice that says we need free market solutions. The voice that says we need to end the failed war on drugs. The voice who will fight for the forgotten man, nonviolent offenders wasting away in prison, and addicts who are afraid to speak up and seek the help they need. We are seeking members for our campaign team. I encourage you to apply. We need donations to help us spread the message of liberty across the state. We can go on hoping for liberty to happen, or we can fight together. I hope you choose the latter and join me today. Find out more at DaleKearns.com.
paid for by Dale Kearns for Office. One more objection that I want to sort of raise that I know many many people might have when they first hear this concept, you know, and, and basically the the main agreement that you see property owners making with each other uh, to create this sort of society is is basically allow others to do as they wish on their own property, which I think generally most libertarians would agree with. But what about when it does come to again what many people see see as rights violations? Let's say it comes to you know holding people in captivity on their property or you know holding children as slaves on their property. How would that sort of thing? Because I mean. And that is, in theory, allowing others to do as they wish on their property. I think most people would be appalled by those things and want to stop them. So how in, in that society would sort of uh, atrocities like that that take place on private property, how could that sort of thing be addressed? OK, that, that's a real good question. And, and I have to point out that my book is not called How to Bring the Garden of Eden right, of course. On, onto <laughs> Earth because – it's just you know, laying out the basic idea. There's, the there's going to be idea. bad people out there, okay? And, and if you have children or something, you certainly don't want them being captured and kidnapped. So, you know, you, you keep them on your property. You're aware of situations where there's there's bad property, just like there is now. I mean, there's, there's parts here in San Francisco, um, the, the Tenderloin District, where it's it's uh, very, very dangerous to uh, to travel at night. And, and it certainly wouldn't be any place for, for a girl to travel late at night. Um so, so basically what we do now is we stay away from bad areas. And, and if, if there's a property owner who doesn't have a security firm and recognize rules and laws on his properties, we would, we would stay away and we would certainly keep children away from that. And if, if that kind of guy came onto one of our properties and kidnapped kids, well, that's a violation. And uh, the security firms would, would certainly go after that guy on his property or, or anywhere else and 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 stop that. So so I don't see that as a as a pro, uh, problem. Now it, it can get a little more tricky when 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 somebody violates a property raw law of what I call a crazy Harry kind of person. And uh, uh, again, if 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 some crazy Harry has crazy laws, the the best way it's going to be avoided. Is just to stay away from things like that, and we, we do it every day now, so it's, I don't really see it as a big problem. However, what people are trying to imply is we have to put in rules so that Crazy Harry can't do crazy stuff on his property, even if somebody wanders on it. But the problem with that is they're looking at that in an ap- absolute, which I think is dangerous, because what they're trying to do is to introduce rules that apply on all properties. It will never stop. You know, if, if somebody wanders onto a property, well, what rule are you going to say? What, what is the penalty for that? What is the, what is the penalty for trespassing? If, if you, can, can, you know, they're going, everybody, the, everybody except for Crazy Harry is going to reject you can't shoot him, but can you put him in jail for 10 years, five years? There's no set rule for any of that. And then you're going to have all these debates. You're going to have debates over what rules should be on what property to save individual people. I mean, you can bring up sob stories for all kinds of individual situations. But... The problem is, if you start applying those rules, what you have is the monster. You have the monster that's called government, that is a central power, that has been known to grow into the most evil form of uh, human structure going, where hundreds of millions of people have died. So it's not a clear cut case of, okay, we're just going to make some simple rules here. When the central power is going to create bad guys at the top, and they're not going to stop there. So the, the best idea is just to recognize private property for what it is, and it's, it's not perfect. It's not the Garden of Eden, but the danger on the other side by starting these rules is governments which have killed hundreds of millions of people. And I, I might add, the United States is the only one that is, has dropped uh, uh, nuclear bombs. So we've, we've got a situation where, you know, we're, we're not innocent on that path either. And uh, who, who knows where we'll end? You know, we are, we're certainly a lot less free now than we were in the 1800s. And it's just creeping, creeping, making rules, more rules over properties. The idea that has to get into people's head is there's a very, very, very good, powerful way to create peace and harmony, and that's just something very basic. 
you leave me alone on my property, I'll leave you alone on your property. And at the fringes, they might be things we have to watch out for, but they are nowhere near the dangers that we move toward on a daily basis by the government instilling more and more rules, watching us, making us fill out forms for uh, taking out more than $10,000 cash in a bank, uh, telling us what we can put in our body, what we can't put in our body, telling us where we can travel, telling us who we can deal with in other foreign countries, taking our money to fight foreign wars to, to build the empire. That's the power problem that we, we face and, and is the most dangerous because that can get out of control and we don't know where it ends. And in many, many cases, it's, it's, hen- it's resulted in deaths of many, 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 many people. The alternative to that is leave me alone. I'll leave you alone. No overarching rules. All right, Robert. Well, I, I think many libertarians will certainly agree with the conclusion of the idea of a private property society. This is certainly a different approach. Now, I think most libertarians do fall into the camps that you talked about in the beginning, uh, utilitarians or uh, the sort of the natural rights or just rights in general concept, individual rights. And uh, for better or worse, this is certainly a new approach. And I'm always interested in new approaches to these ideas. I think the conversation as you as you do as well, I find the conversation uh, vo- both exciting and important to, to have. So I certainly appreciate your unique perspective here. And I encourage people to check out the book. Why don't you just wrap things up by telling everybody exactly where they can find this book. And of course, uh, feel free to plug everything else you've got going on. Your very popular couple of blogs that are are out there and anything else you'd like to promote. Sure. Um, The the book is called The Foundations of Private Property Society Theory. Subtitle is Anarchism for the Civilized Person. And it's available at Amazon, available at Barnes and Noble. And if you walk into a a local bookstore, they'll be able to order it for you. Also, you can go to lulu.com, which uh, also carries the book. Um, as far as my, my other uh, adventures, I, I write two blogs. I, I post on a daily basis. One is called economicpolicyjournal.com, where I talk about the economy. And the other is uh, targetliberty.com, where, where I talk about liberty and infringements on liberty and where it looks like we're going and the the terrible things that the government is doing and maybe maybe small little ways that that can be changed towards uh towards liberty and uh, i also publish an investment newsletter that's out uh every day that the uh, new york stock exchange is open it's called the epj daily alert and you can find more information on that at uh my economic policy journal.com site mark it's been a pleasure thanks very much uh I really appreciate your uh, your taking the time to uh, cover my my new book. Absolutely, Robert. It's been a pleasure as always, and keep up the great work. And I know you will, of course, keep on. Well, not maybe not keep on roaring, but you'll keep on prowling. Huh. That I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> All righty. Thanks a lot, Robert. I appreciate yep. it. Bye, Mark. All right, Katie Katz, hope you enjoyed my conversation there with Mr. Robert Wenzel. Uh, as I mentioned, he was one of the uh, very first guests in the first you know, three or four months of this podcast back in the day. So it was great to have him back again. Of course, I had him back a couple months ago, also in the debate with Walter Block. I'll post all of this stuff over at today's show notes at lionsofliberty.com slash 346. want to give you guys a little update. We are getting closer and closer to our goal of hitting $1,500 a month, which will send at least me and John Odermatt to New Orleans to cover the Libertarian National Convention. Of course, thanks to you guys and your support through the Lions of Liberty Pride, which of course you can find more about by heading over to lionsofliberty.com slash support. Thanks to you guys, we are already going to Porkfest in New Hampshire. It's being run by our good friend Roger Paxson of the Lions Lava Flow podcast, and we are very, very excited and somewhat terrified for this event. Terrified only because we have agreed, uh, the six of us who are involved in this podcast have agreed to partake in the uh, Vaunted Whiskey Challenge, uh, an event from our, our college days that we're going to recreate as adults that probably can't really handle it like we could when we were younger, and uh, we're going to record a podcast while we're doing it. So either way, it's going to be very interesting. Of course, we're also going to record a live League of Liberty podcast, which uh, members of the Lions of Liberty Pride know all about. 
That is myself, Johnny Rocket Adams of the Johnny Rocket Launchpad, Chris Spangle of We Are Libertarians, and Roger Paxson of the Lava Flow Podcast, our super team of libertarian podcasts that have come together to create a new podcast that you can only hear if you support one of our four shows. So if you if you donate to either the Lions of Liberty Podcast or any of the other three shows, you can hear the League of Liberty Podcast, and that is a that is a gets contentious at times. Let's just let's just leave it at that. And uh, but it is always a fun time talking to those guys. So I'm very excited about what we've been able to do thanks to the donations of our amazing listeners, you guys right here. And even if you're not donating, I am thankful for you just listening, just being here, just downloading the show, telling your friends about it, uh, engaging in this conversation because that is really the most important thing. Uh, I wanted to have Robert on because he has presented a sort of new idea and new way of looking at a potential libertarian society. Uh, I really appreciate anybody that puts in the effort to, uh, I guess, address how a libertarian society could come about or how a more free, private property-based world could actually function. So that's why I wanted to have him on today. Of course, I've had many guests on that have many different theories or ways that they look at approaching the ideas of liberty. Uh, I had Stefan Kinsella on talking about argumentation ethics a few months ago. I had Shane Whistler on talking about his book, Reason and Liberty. Uh, There's really a lot of different takes on it, and I try to present that to you guys to uh, determine for yourselves, <laughs> I guess, what what the best way is. And of course, you can you can help be a part of this conversation by coming over to our public forum. That's the Lions of Liberty Forum on Facebook. We also have a Discord channel, so I'll link to that as well. Uh, both of those are entirely public. Anybody can come in there. Now, for Lions of Liberty Pride members, we have a, a, additional private groups where you can directly ask us questions about certain things and uh, you know, um, ask, send us questions for guests and that sort of thing. So there's definitely an added bonus to being in the Pride but even if you're not, it's totally cool. We want you to be a part of this community, a part of this conversation. So please do uh, connect with us. If you have any questions about getting into any of this stuff, just hit me an email. It's uh, Mark, M-A-R-C, at lionsofliberty.com. I'm also easy to find on Facebook. You can drop me a PM. I'm pretty open. I'm a pretty open book, guys. So any way you want to connect with this show or even just to have ideas, feel free to reach out. And please do keep on keeping on listening to all the fine shows that we bring to you here at Lions of Liberty. Of course, Brian McWilliams will be back this coming Wednesday with another episode of Electric Liberty Land, your weekly shot of comedy, culture, and liberty. Really great interview he did uh, last week with Bridget Fetisy. Please do check that out. And of course, John Odie Odermatt will always, once again, bring you another hard-hitting look at the broken criminal justice system on Felony Friday. And until next time, folks, you know what I'm going to ask you to do. It's simply to live long and live free. This is Roger Paxton, and if you're fed up with the government running every single aspect of your life, but you're not listening to the Lava Flow podcast yet, then what's wrong with you? Check us out at thelavaflow.com, or just go back to sucking up to the government. The Lava Flow podcast, striking the root every single episode. This is Chris Spangle, and I am the host of We Are Libertarians, which you can find in iTunes, Google Play, or at wearelibertarians.com. We are a podcast that brings you all of the irreverence that modern politics deserves by examining current events from a libertarian perspective. So please, check us out at wearelibertarians.com. Hey, Liberty Rockers, this is Johnny Rocket from the Johnny Rocket Launchpad. Each week, I strive to bring you the best guests in talk radio. The Johnny Rocket Launchpad delivers weekly interviews of noteworthy politicians, economists, and activists. The Johnny Rocket Launchpad is bringing the party to the Libertarian Party and launching ideas in your direction. Check it out at johnnyrocketlaunchpad.com or find us on iTunes. Each show is action-packed, explicit, and a lot of fun. So join me at johnnyrocketlaunchpad.com every week for the newest episode. Keep liberty alive and rock and roll.